Will you please pray with me? God, we ask that it is you we hear and feel in these words and in this place. Amen. Are you comfortable right now? Yeah? So a good temperature in here? Temperature's fine. So are the seats okay? Nice, nice and cozy. Do you find rest here? Yeah? Why? Nobody knows why? I mean, why are you, why are you comfortable right now? It's safe. It's safe. It's restful. Okay, let's see here. I'm going to ask. Who can I ask that won't be too embarrassed by this? Who's really comfortable right now? Really comfortable. Okay, Maxine, you said you're really comfortable. Why don't you come up here with me for a minute? Let's come on up. You shouldn't have said you were really comfortable, huh? Oh, we're going to come all the way up here. Okay, I just need you to, to come stand over here. Right here. Okay. You just give this sermon. I'm going to sit down now. That's with us. So Stephen's going to tell us all about that. Oh, okay. <laughs> do, you, do you feel comfortable up here? You can be honest. No, no, not really. Okay. You can sit down if you'd like. <laughs> really, what, what I'm getting at is, um, should we always be comfortable? I mean, that's what we kind of strive for in life, right? I mean, if you watch a commercial about retirement, that's what it's all on, isn't it? You need to have that number in mind so that you'll be comfortable for life, right? You need to start on that now. Our whole life is building up to just being comfortable. But should we always be comfortable? No. Oh, I can stop talking then. We, uh, when, when I was in um, middle school, uh, I played soccer a lot growing up. When I was in middle school, um, in one of the practices, we were practicing corner kicks, and we were doing it from each side, and then our coach told us, well, start kicking with your non-dominant foot. So I'm right-footed, so I started kicking with my left foot, and I'm not, I wasn't very good at kicking with my left foot. I just happened to be less bad than the rest of the team. And so my position changed, and I became a left midfielder. If you know anything about soccer, midfield plays both offense and defense, and the left side means that you're predominantly kicking with your left foot most of the time. And you're defending normally the best player on the other team, their right striker on most, most occasions. And so it was really uncomfortable for me to do this. I had to teach my non-dominant foot how to become more dominant. And it was a, it was a long, several-year task to kind of get better at it. And it was not easy, and it was not comfortable but it's what I was just told to do. And if I wanted to play soccer, I had to do it. In our lives, we seem to equate comfort and ease. This hand's open. When I do this, it's like I'm opening it like this. Comfort and ease. The easier something is, the more comfortable it feels, right? Normally. The more difficult the task, the more uncomfortable we become. But I'm not sure that we should always be equating these two. How easy is it for you, and you can do this if you want, how easy is it for you to pull your wallet out right now? Nobody's doing it. Is it easy? It's pretty easy, normally, right? It's pretty easy to just pull your wallet out of your pocket. How easy would it be for you to just open it up, turn it upside down, and dump everything out? It was easy, right? (laughs) It's easy, but it's probably not very comfortable for most of us, is it? It's an easy task, but it does make us feel a little uneasy and a little uncomfortable. How easy is it for us to get out our calendar and write down a task for once a month? Like, say, every second Tuesday evening, bam, I put a task on there. That's pretty easy to actually do. But it makes many of us uncomfortable to commit to a a once-a-month church commitment, right? Easy, 
a little uncomfortable. How easy is it for us to love our neighbor or to welcome the stranger? It's easy to say that. It's really easy for us to say, yeah, I love my neighbor. Yeah, everyone is welcome here. It's harder to do, and it will make us have moments of being uncomfortable. If you're truly loving somebody, there will be moments where you are uncomfortable. This week, as we've already discussed, is the start of our stewardship campaign. And something that should be easy for us, and yet it does make many of us feel uncomfortable. I mean, we all know we need budgets and money to function in life, but when the church speaks on the subject, we want to tune it out because it does make us uncomfortable. Jesus had no problem speaking about money. We know that, right? He talks more about money than heaven and hell combined. He talks more about money than love. He talks about money a lot. But we tune it out. We forget about it. Jesus had no problem speaking about money, so I don't think we should either. Our church needs money. We need money to do ministry, to feed the hungry, to visit the sick, to welcome the stranger, to clothe the naked, to give rest to the weary with Matt eleven twenty eight, and so much more. But not only are we starting a stewardship campaign, but it just falls on World Communion Sunday this year. And World Communion Sunday is a day where we recognize and celebrate that Christ's church is multi-ethnic, multi-class, and worldwide. It's not just people that look like us. It's not just people that think like us or dress like us. Christ's church is worldwide. And it reminds us that we all are the stranger, and yet we all are welcome. We all are the sinner, and yet we all are forgiven. We all are not worthy, and yet we all are loved. It reminds us that we aren't in control of the church Christ is, and we remember all this when we gather at Christ's table, not just with those of us here, but with the entire body of believers. Because communion I mean true communion, really welcoming and inviting everyone to the table, really offering rest to those people who are burdened and weighed down in life, is one of the hardest things we can do. And if we're not feeling that acceptance in our life when we gather, if we're not overwhelmed with the response to that forgiveness and love that is displayed in our sisters' and brothers' lives when they come to the table, then we're probably not doing it right. We're probably trying to take the easy way, the comfortable way, where we say, yeah, everyone's welcome, yeah, forgiveness and acceptance is here, but we never externalize it. We just keep it for ourselves, because we're comfortable that way. Now you might be thinking, what's he talking about being uncomfortable and it not being easy? We just heard in Scripture, we heard Jesus say that it will be easy, didn't we? Because Jesus just said, quote, put on my yoke, my yoke is easy to bear, and my burden is light. What? He just said it's easy. Well, what do you think Jesus really means by this? I think we need to put it back in context to see what he's talking about. So we're going to back up a bit in the Gospel of Matthew, and we see Jesus is speaking to the people about John the Baptist and how great his ministry is. They're questioning him. What, what was the purpose of John? Why did he come? He's arrested now, and his, his followers are trying to find some comfort in what's happening. But not everybody saw John as great. And so Jesus says this to them, and we'll see it up on the screen too. He says... But to what will I compare this generation? It's like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We wailed and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking and they say, he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking and they say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. Jesus is intentionally making us uncomfortable. Because the words he's saying aren't easy if we really get into them. How many of us have been around a kid who just keeps saying, Dad, 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 or maybe Mom. 
or grandma or grandpa, whatever it might be, right? And what happens when dad finally answers the kid? Yeah, and what's it? the child has no clue what to do, right? I mean, they just said, they said dad for the last 30 seconds. You think that there was a reason that they were, that they were saying dad, but it's because the ask itself was the performance. The purpose of saying dad repeatedly is to say dad repeatedly. There's not a greater intention behind it except to get some kind of attention back, but there isn't really a motivation beyond that. That's all too real in my life right now with our kids. But we are all like those kids. In our worship, in our prayers, in our requests, it's just like we're saying, God, 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 don't you hear me? God, I'm asking God, where are you? God, what's going on? Or maybe we say things like, God, please give me a parking spot that's close to the door. I don't feel like walking today. We trivialize it. But we are, we are like those children, and yet when God responds, we're often unprepared. Or the response just makes us too uncomfortable. Jesus came to show us a path to God, and we often are made uncomfortable by his requests. And so we say things like, but I played the flute, I sang those songs, and you didn't dance. You didn't dance the way I wanted you to dance. You didn't respond in the way that I wanted you to respond. I wanted you to pat me on the back, not make me uncomfortable. And in this passage, Jesus is saying, it doesn't matter what we think or how we treat him because Sophia, wisdom, the spirit, God's actions overcome our doubt, overcome our uncomfortableness. So something needs to change. It's not about me. Something needs to change. And so Jesus continues. He says, Then he began to reproach the cities in which most of his deeds of power had been done, because they did not repent. He said, Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the deeds of power done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and in ashes. But I tell you, on the day of judgment, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? No, you will be brought down to Hades. For if the deeds of power done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that on the day of judgment, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom than for you. How many of you are familiar with all those cities, right? We, all, we could all probably just look at a map and point them all out, right? No, and we don't need to. We don't need to know their full history or what's going on to get at the meaning of this passage. Jesus is saying that, that God's love, God's grace and forgiveness have been extended to these cities, to these people, and yet their hearts have not changed. They're still unwilling to do God's work. Jesus is saying... That God's love, God's grace, God's forgiveness has been extended to us. Are our hearts going to change? Are we going to do God's work? Or would we rather just stay comfortable in our sin like these cities than to venture into the unknown world of loving God with all our being and loving our neighbor as ourselves. Not just saying those words, but doing it. Jesus is telling us there needs to be a change in our attitudes, in our intentions, in our heart. So we need to be okay with being uncomfortable to be able to do God's will. But he doesn't stop there. The passage continues. He says, and it says that at that time Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. It's kind of an insult to us, right? He calls us wise and intelligent, but he says we don't get it. But babies, 
infants understand this. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Christ chose to reveal God's love to the world. We are supposed to see it, to know it, to experience that love and be moved to share it. We have been chosen and given a call. It's only after all of this, this is all a build-up to get to that part that seems so nice on first reading. It's only after all of this, and you'll see this up on the board too, that Jesus says to the crowds and to us, he says, Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So yeah, he does use the word easy. But it doesn't mean that it's always easy. Because taking Christ's yoke means changing our hearts. It means serving those who need rest. It means sharing in your restful place, finding those restful places in others' lives and celebrating with them. It means funding and volunteering with great ministry like Matt 11.28. Taking Christ's yoke means showing others the overwhelming acceptance and forgiveness that we are shown every week at this table. It means being willing to add a leaf or two to make sure there's room for everybody who needs rest. Putting on Christ's yoke means tithing our money, tithing our time, giving 10% or more back, being committed to God's cause in our lives. All of this seems difficult, and it seems like things that would make us uncomfortable and not give us rest, doesn't it? But, if our hearts are transformed, if in our hearts we see that God extends to us peace and love, grace and forgiveness, hope for a better world, then... And only then does it become easy to extend these gifts to others because we know that they come to us in abundance. It becomes easy to invite and welcome others into this restful place, abounding with the presence of God. But if our hearts aren't changed, if we don't see God as the source of our energy, of our hope, of our joy, then it will be difficult and we will remain comfortable. And we will be more willing to go back to the easy life of going through the motions and staying completely dull and comfortable. If our hearts aren't changed, then it's easier to argue about music and the order of worship than to push against injustice and inequality in our community. I don't know about you, but I don't remember Jesus talking about how we should be arguing over the order of worship, or music. But I do know that Jesus tells us that we need to serve those in need and push against injustice and inequality. One comes with the change in our hearts. And over the next several weeks, we will see that the ways our church serves and the ways that we'll have opportunities to take on Christ's yoke for the next year and beyond, each week, As we learn more about our major ministries, we will expand our understanding of stewardship and we will see how Christ's table grows the more we serve. We'll literally see the table grow because in a minute we're going to add leaves to it because we just talked about how more are welcome here. And I pray that we not enter into this season lightly, but prayerfully discern how we are each being called to serve God with our money to serve God with our time, with our talents, our comfort, our lives, our hearts and souls. We will never grow if we always take the easy way. We will never grow 
if we are only about our comfort, we, Christ's body, will only grow when we take on Christ's yoke and allow for our hearts to change and allow for ourselves to see how God gives to us so abundantly so that we might freely and easily give to those who need rest. Amen.